Anyway, uh, welcome everybody to this is our first in this this series in 2023 for the Summit Lunch and Learn. I think many of you have probably been with us before, but I'm sure you attend a lot of other webinars and things as well. So a few reminders, even for those who have been here before. Um, we uh, the way this works is it's the presentation material is actually done in three parts. On my chart here, it kind of looks like it's two parts, but that's only because there's just the two speakers. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna do the first half of my session on IBMI services for RPGers. Uh, that will um, take about 15 minutes if all goes well. Um, and then after that, I'm going to introduce Rob to talk about uh, how to build web apps with no coding whatsoever. Um, and I know that's true because we've done it ourselves. Any of you who looked for a, um, if you wrote in and asked for your list of links, because maybe you didn't get the email from Zoom, it was a valence application that actually uh, was used to generate that list and send it off to you. So um, just, uh, just a little tip in there. Uh, so I'm going to come in at the beginning, Rob's going to come in the middle, and then I'm going to come back in with a second part for of IBMI services at the end after Rob's session. So my IBMI services is going to be sort of the, the appetizer and dessert portion of our meal. And the main, um, main part of the meal is going to be from Rob. So that's the way these things go. A uh, couple of uh, things uh, the ch chat shouldn't be used for questions about content. Questions about content, whether it's myself or Rob's content, uh, should go into Q&A. The chat is just for general chat with the uh, speakers, you know, like the hi and all that we've ha had here, as well as, of course, if you, um, John will be putting in the link to the handouts and any other questions that somebody may have that are more, that not specifically related to the content of the, the sessions as we're speaking here. I think, I hope anyway, I've remembered to uh, cover everything that I need to. If not, maybe John will um, speak up and remind me what I've forgotten. Otherwise, I will just go ahead and get started with my IBMI services for RPGers. Now, you might be familiar with IBM I services, but just in case, um, it's basically access to IBM system objects, information, system information, um, often very similar information uh, that is supplied in other ways, like CL commands with or without out file support uh, or system API calls. They're supplied by IBM, um, but you, and they're meant to be accessed via SQL. So it's a grouping of SQL views, functions, table functions, and procedures. Often they are simpler than using previous message methods. Uh, not always, but often. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples where so it's a lot easier and somewhere it's maybe debatable as to whether it's actually sim uh, simpler to do it with the API method you already may know or um, with the... Um, native RPG functions like data areas and things like that, for example, which RPG has native access to those kind of things as well. Now, if you are if you're like me, when the IBMI services first came out, these SQL services, um, that most of them initially seemed to me to be focused mostly on system admin kind of things. And hey, we as developers wear a lot of hats and a lot of times we do system admin ourselves. So not that that's not useful to us as developers, but I was more interested in, in my teaching anyway, and focusing on things specifically for developers. And I was kind of surprised to learn, uh, to wake up to the fact that a lot of enhancements have been made to these services and additions that are much more focused toward um, developers. And that's why I wanted to cover this session here in our Lunch and Learn. Now, why this matters is not so much because I think you will you know, go and replace all your API stuff with the uh, um, with one of these services, you may, in some cases, in other cases, you may find that it's not the best solution, but it can sometimes be a much simpler solution. And simplicity makes it easier to create your own customized utility programs that save a lot of time, or you can even uh, do some things for problem determination for error handling in RPG. I'll show you some examples about that a little bit later in part two. Um, Simpler code, of course, is always easier to maintain by either yourself 
and or less experienced coders. Um, so again, you want to keep in mind, it may not be the best solution, but it is a solution. It's another tool in your toolbox. And I'm always keen to make sure that everybody takes advantage or at least knows about all the tools that are in their toolbox available to them as RPGers. In this first section, I'm going to be talking about um, personally my own experience with this because I wrote my own little utility for my use 20 something years ago. It's been a long time. Uh, and all using a lot of APIs. And I found out just how much I could have saved, how much time I could have saved if I'd had one of these services available. So uh, I've redone that work now using the SQL services and I'll go through that, that process. And in the second part, we'll talk about a lot of other uh, things that you could use. My challenge to you is to think of ways that you can use these, not necessarily to try to figure out, well, how would I use that specific thing she's done here? Um, what I'd like you to do is just kind of think and open your mind to, well, if I had something like that, what might I do with it? Um, could I make something better? Could I create a new utility? Things like that. So that's, that's what I'd like for you to get out of this session. The, uh, there are categories. There's a DB2-4i technology wiki. The link is at the bottom of this chart here. And in that wiki, they have uh, sort of categorized the services. And the ones that I'm going to be concentrating on here are the application services. In the first part here, I'm going to talk about uh, mostly about the application services. We'll also be talking about um, IFS services. Actually, I'm not sure if I really uh, cover in this presentation specifically any of the message handling services, but they would be useful for to developers and spool services. So we'll talk about some of the kind of things that we can do with those. So this is just kind of an idea of the types of things that, to me anyway, seem like they might be useful for developers specifically. So with that, let me give you a little bit of my story. Um, this is, uh, as I mentioned to you several years ago, I wrote my own little utility. The client I was working with um, did, had a habit, which personally I'm not fond of, but they had a habit of um, copying modules into programs and rather than using service programs. I'm a service program fan myself, uh, but they were not so much. So um, whenever I made changes to a uh, given modules code, that they had, I needed to go find all the places where it needed to be replaced in all those programs. And they didn't have good change management uh, software to help out with that process. So I wrote this ultra simple little utility to collect all that information and throw it into a database file, a physical file. And I would use that to find which object I need to update or even perhaps if I could convince them uh, to identify candidate modules to put in a service program, because that's the purpose of service programs if something's used in a lot of different places. It's much easier for maintenance and a lot of other reasons um, to, uh, to put it in a service program. So those are the kinds of things I did with this. Now, this was all before we had these IBMI services, so I used APIs to do it. And it was, um, I used in this case, I actually had to use four different APIs because the APIs for getting the information from the programs and service programs, uh, the, all that information was dumped into user spaces. So I first had to learn how to create a user space from my program and how to get, an get access to that user space. So those are the first two um, APIs I used. And then the other two were um, getting program information about ILE programs and about ILE service programs. And then once I had all the information in the user space, then I iterated my way through the user space, just writing all those rows out to a database table. And from there, I would use SQL to do whatever queries I needed to do. And I'll show you some examples of the kind of things that I was, I was looking at in a moment. If you're interested in that old version of my utility and a little more backstory of, of that, uh, why I was doing this, um, I've got a link to my IT jungle um, session here. By the way, I happened to notice when I looked at that yesterday that I'm afraid that uh, the IT jungle folks, um, that the link doesn't seem to be working to download the code. But the good news is, I mean, the, the moral of this story really is you don't want to use that code. You want to use, uh, I think you're probably going to want to use the IBMI services anyway. So uh, just, but I wanted to include that for 
completeness if you want to read more about my thought process. Now, here's uh, I, just for just a second here. Let me see if I can. I think I've got the code. Just to give you an idea. I mean, this is the code. I mean, there's a lot of comments in there, obviously, but it's it's over 200 lines of code, a whole bunch of data structures that I had to figure out how to define an RPG from the API documentation, which is not always as RPG friendly as we'd like. Um, and you can see that I have all the um, whole bunch of calls to um, to the APIs and things like that going on here. So like I said, over 200 lines of code, not a huge amount, but still, uh, and uh, more so than the amount of code, is the amount of time it took me to figure out how to do all of that stuff uh, from the API documentation and where it all was and all of that. Guess what? After IV My Services comes along, all that code goes away. My program is no of no use anymore. <laughs> now all that information is just there, so to speak. Um, when I, I say just there in quotes, because I mean, it really isn't sitting there in a database file as it appears to be. Um, it, there is work going on under the covers, and which is why sometimes it may take a little longer than you might expect to, for some of this data to be gathered if you ask for the world, you know, if you ask for ask it to look at every program on the entire system, for example. Um, but that all the information that I had ca captured, which is uh, listed here and kind of shown in the picture down here, that's all there already as one of these IBMI services uh, in the form of a view, an SQL view. So the uh, name of the SQL view, uh, qsys2.boundmodule.info. And it has includes info for, bus, for both programs and service programs. And so it just gives me one row for every single module and every single program and or every single service program, right? So, so this one query now that I just did in ACS, run SQL scripts, that's how I run my, you know, one of kind of, uh, um, R, um, sorry, RPG, no, SQL, that's the right word, uh, SQL code. Uh, so I just ran this in uh, ACS run SQL scripts and you can see the, the results down at the bottom. So my code is gone, all my beautiful code. Um, it's of no use anymore, or no need for it. I shouldn't say it's not useful, but it's not really needed anymore. Um, now, as I said, some things that I might want to do are, are to answer questions like, are there any service program candidates in here? Are there any modules that appear in more than one place? And so I used SQL. See, this is the beauty of having SQL as your interface to this, um, is that, it, you can go specifically after the stuff that you're interested in. So notice I've done a group by, and I've said I only and took a count of how many of them were in each group. So I'm basically saying only show me the, the case where the, uh, the count is greater than one, right? I don't care about the ones where it only appears in one program. I only care about the ones where it appears in multiple. Now you can see this is my little play library. I don't have a lot of code in here. So as you can see, I've, I don't have a huge results set here. Um, but I do have uh, a few modules that are used in either two or three uh, programs. So if I wanted to take a look at one of those, I could just pick another SQL statement and I could do something like this. Again, all still working from that same view, right? I'm doing nothing fancy here other than going into um, run SQL scripts and calling up. In my case, I have these saved in a special you know, SQL examples file that I use for this kind of stuff. Um, and so I just pull this stuff up and I go after, okay, it's this, in this case, I want this library and this particular module, that one that said it appeared in three different places. Um, and here are the results that I get from that. Now, oddly, <laughs> you might think, and like I said, this is kind of a play library that I have. So it kind of explains the reason for it, I guess. But um, it turns out that that debug subproc module appears in um, two different service programs already. Plus on top of that, it's also copied into a program. So it seems to be almost a no brainer if this were a real application that I was looking at instead of just my play stuff. Um, seems to me this would be a good candidate for saying that program right there, that debug RPG4 program probably should be using one of those service programs rather than um, having a copy of the, of the module. And that would make life easier. Also might want to consider 
do I really want the same module in both in two different service programs? So those kinds of questions are the things that I personally have used this for. I also have clients that had information um, that they needed me to, to look at for things like um, what they, they I needed to compile things to a previous release. And I always went through and checked to make sure uh, was everything compiled to, to the previous release. So I could use an SQL statement to say, show me anything where target release is not the one that it should have been, right? So there's uh, things like that. Also, we had to remove debug data uh, from that particular application for reasons that we'll go into. Um, but uh, basically, again, that's a simple query using all this information available to us. It was in my, um, in the stuff that I created, but now that and a whole lot more information. I mean, not just the little bit that I showed you, another 40 or so fields of data, columns of data are available from the bound module information. And you just, just treat it like a, a file. It's a, an SQL view, right? So, uh, and it's not just about modules and service programs. There's activation groups, signatures for service programs, exported procedures, binding directories, whole bunch of other things like that. So open your mind up if you hadn't thought about it. If you use ILE particularly, then this, the examples I've shown you so far. In the next session, section, I will be talking about um, some things that are not specifically related to ILE stuff. I do a lot of ILE stuff, so that's uh, why it was particularly important to me. Um, what I did here, as I mentioned, is I just saved these sample SQL statements and I go pull them up and just run them and run SQL scripts. Obviously, a user interface, a real live user interface for these queries would be much better. I just was kind of lazy, I guess, and, and hadn't, haven't uh, yet done that for myself, for my own use. Um, I also have some of the things you saw that you'll see as we go through some of these examples, a lot of them are hard coded. Uh, have hard-coded values. Obviously, if you've better been to RPG, you would use program variables for that. Sometimes, for example, feeding result data from one query to another. So once I found the, the, a module that had that appeared multiple times, I could then go and use that as input to the next query, which um, talks about, okay, what programs are those in, right? Um, the interfaces that I might use for this would are not limited to RPG. I say this is for RPGers, so uh, that's why I'm, I'm mentioning that. But of course, SQL is ubiquitous, and a lot of tools have the ability to use SQL. As a matter of fact, I think you're going to find, uh, and I know this because I use uh, the tool as myself, uh, that the product that Rob's going to talk to you about, the tool that Rob's going to talk to you about, um, can also access these things because it's SQL. So why not? Um, and so maybe he'll uh, talk a little bit. I think he's actually already got some stuff, uh, some utilities and things built in. Uh, to the tool that use some of these kinds of services. That's it from my um, my session. Uh, in part two, as again, again, I said I will talk about a few other services, um, things other than just modules, objects, and programs and service programs to get your creative juices flowing to come up with ways you can use these. But for now, I am. I think it is ready for our main course. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rob Swanson and also Richard Malone, who will have a, a few words to say to us as well. Guys, welcome. Thank you, Susan. Uh, let's see. I'll share my screen. Just stop here. Here. Oh, there, nice. go. Yeah. Okay. there we go. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, the the uh, this segment, the main course, if you will, I hope it lives up to the hype, is uh, how to build a dazzling uh, web app, in this case, on an IBM I in minutes uh, with no coding. Um, my name is Rob Swanson. I'm one of the partners at CNX. My colleague Richard is the, uh, the other guy on the video here, and he'll be uh, addressing any questions you have. And if he thinks you're asking something highly pertinent that I should uh, get into right away, he'll interrupt me and rudely tell me to answer a question. So uh, I'll just say hello. Hi, everybody. Um, like Rob said, I'm Richard. I'm just going to be sitting here. I'm going to turn my camera off, but I'll be sitting here watching the Q&A. Be sure not to post your questions in the chat. Just one more reminder of that. Please post them in the Q&A section. 
And uh, don't be shy. If you don't ask questions, I won't be doing anything. So please ask plenty of questions. And if I feel that uh, I get a juicy enough question or something isn't important enough, I will interrupt Rob and ask him to clarify. Thanks. All right. Uh, so without wasting any time, let's just go right into a demo and we'll do a practical example of what Susan was just introdu introducing there with the uh, SQL services. So I'm going to switch over to a browser. So Valence, uh, in a nutshell, is a, is a web portal for IBM I. You, know, you can download it for free and kick the tires all you like. And once you've installed it, and the installation takes literally like five minutes, uh, you'll get a login screen that looks just like this. And you can, of course, customize this with your company colors and logo and, and so forth. But this is the vanilla generic uh, Valence login screen. And I'm coming at you here from Chicago. But from time to time, I'm in Costa Rica, and in, in cuando quisiera practicar mi español, I might switch my language to uh, Spanish and then log in accordingly. And you'll notice that a lot of the uh, 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 literals are actually uh, in, in Spanish. We also have uh, six or seven other languages out there, too. But I'll switch back to, uh, to English for the duration here. So when you log in, this is your launch pad, your, your portal, all the applications you can run. This is all running natively on IBM I and the QHTTP server subsystem. Um, and what I'm going to demonstrate right now is our low code utility, our low code app builder tool called Nitro App Builder. I'm just going to click on this to launch it. And it'll show you a list of what are data, we call data sources and widgets. And I'll, I'll get into a deeper explanation of what those are in a moment. I just want to quickly just take what Susan just did while, you're, while it's fresh in your mind and just create a quick application out of it. So I'm gonna go here, do here and say, let's add a data source. Now, normally we advocate creating data sources using SQL, but you could, if you wanted to use a wizard tool, similar to like the green screen start query um, and create a, a data source that way. But, and you could also import any, any SQL queries or, or you know, start query uh, app queries you've already defined from, uh, from this button here. But what I'm gonna do is just go flip over here real quick. I created two little SQL statements uh, modeled off of what Susan was just covering. Uh, this first one here on the left is gonna give me a list of uh, program objects in our Valence 6.2 development library. So just a quick plug, Valence 6.1 is currently uh, in general release. We'll be announcing Valence 6.2 at the uh, Common Spring Power Up Conference in Denver next month. So hopefully some of you will be there and you can drop by the booth and say hi. But anyway, so this, this SQL statement here on the left is just basically uh, giving me a list of program objects in our Valence 6.2 development library sorted by program name. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it right into here. And I'm going to say, OK, preview it. So it's giving me a, a list. Uh, basically, it's executing that query and giving me a sample of what's coming back from that. So this looks this looks like what I was expecting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to call it uh, Valence 6.2 Program Objects. And I'll give this a tag of lunch so I can find it easier. OK, so I've got I've got this data source created here. Now I'm going to create something to visualize that data. So I got my SQL statement. Now I want to create a widget over it, and I'm going to create a grid widget, which is basically like a subfile on steroids for us RPGers. So it's it's interrogated my data source. It sees all the different columns that are in there, and it's pulling the labels that come by default from that SQL uh, utility. And it's interesting that some of the labels don't exactly line up with uh, uh, with the columns. So I'm going to fix that. I'm going to change them. First of all, I'm going to select all these columns and then I change this label to say library program. This will be, uh, we'll just say type description created on owner attribute activation group. This is the, the user authority. I said it's just the user off. This is the target release size, and that's, I think that's actually in kilobytes, and number of modules. So you can see as I was doing this, it was adjusting my, my sample down here. So this is what my grid would look like uh, once rendered. 
And I might want to say, okay, I, I think at this timestamp, I want to I want to make that a little uh, more user friendly. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to put a, a formatter on that, and I'm going to say take the timestamp and make it ISO with the uh, AM PM convention on the time. So that'll that'll switch that and show something a little bit more uh, pertinent. And I think that's pretty good. I, I think I'll leave everything as is. I'm going to go here to the configure section. I'm going to let users uh, give them the ability to resize, move, or hide columns if they if they want to. Obviously, our users for this app are going to be RPG developers. Um, I'm going to do a slim view so I can squeeze more items on there. You'll notice by default I'm paging 25 at a time. I'll say let's do let's do a page size of 100. It's the equivalent of loading your subfile pages. And I'm going to give an ability to download this to Excel. We'll just call it programs. And then one more thing I'm going to add real quick while we're in here is I'm going to go to the filter tab and I say, let's give an ability to search on the program name. And I'm going to say force uppercase because all the IBM objects are, of course, uppercase. And I'm going to say we'll use an operator of starts with. So you'll notice now there's a there's a um, option here to say, okay, I want to I want something that starts with uh, BV. So that now all my programs are just starting with BV. So gotta move this thing out of my way. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and save that without uh, any further tinkering. We'll call this uh, <clears throat> balance six two program objects grid and we'll give this a tag of lunch okay so now we've got our valence 62 program objects and our grid i'm going to create one more data source using another this one was exact essentially exactly what uh, susan was demonstrating this is a list of modules that I want to be able to show uh, within my app as well. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this and create another data source. So again, I'm just selecting various elements from the QSYS2 bound module info, where the program library is in our Valence 6.2 development library and sorting by bound module. So my preview looks good. These are the, the columns I was expecting. So I'll go ahead and save this. Now I'll just call it bound modules. And I'm going to go ahead and create a widget off that as well. I can just click this shortcut here. Give me a grid. Give me all the columns. And let's just clean these up real quick. So programs is library. I think I'd like to have that listed first. Uh, this is module library module attribute source file lib source file source member module created on and this will be source changed and i'm also let me bring this up a little bit i'm going to go ahead and change these timestamps to use that same format we had earlier so we'll go with that and of course, you can set a default global date format for any date columns that come back in your in your queries. And I think that's good. I'm gonna let's see. Let's change this to be. I mean, what we have is called a flex width here. So <clears throat> all these are equal width. They're all one, and then these two timestamps are two. So that means they're double the width of these. You could put specific pixel widths as well if you wanted to. Um, so, for example, if I knew this uh, library would never be more than eighty pixels, I could I could do that, and I would lock that would lock this at eighty pixels. So then, if I change the width of my screen, because everyone has different resolutions, you can see all these other columns are adjusting, but the library is staying the same. So when you get into web development, you always have to consider the fact that some people have really super high resolution, you know, double pane monitors, and some people have these uh, crappy Windows laptops that don't, uh, you know, like the Google laptop that has very low resolution. So you got to kind of make sure you address that because it's a lot different than the green screen world where you just assume everyone can see everything, the full 24 by, 24 by uh, 80. 
Okay, so likewise, I'll just give an ability to, to let people tweak things. We'll go with a slim view. I'm gonna say no paging on this and uh, give them the ability to download to Excel if they want to. Let's do this one and we'll call it modules. Okay. Okay, so I've so far, in a span of, of about four minutes, created two, let's just limit my list here. I've created two data sources, program objects and bound mo and modules, and then two grids depicting them. So now I'm gonna whip together an app that pulls those widgets into my app. And notice, I, other than the SQL, I didn't do any coding. And that's the idea here, just so you can quickly whip out an application just with knowledge of your database. So let's just see the launch related things. So I'm going to start my application with a list of all the program objects. So I'm going to click that and it's bringing it in now. And I can just say, they want 6.2 program objects. So I gave my app this title bar here. I see my, I got my, my program filter there. And I think I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm just going to go ahead and save it for now with what we got. And I'm going to put this up in the administration section. So you'll notice now, if I go back to my launch pad, I just created that application. So I created my data source, I created my, my grid widget, and I threw that grid widget into an app. So now I can send this URL to anybody in, in the company, and they can launch this app and see, okay, here's a list of all of our program objects on the system. So I can page through this, and I can see all the various elements in the forthcoming valence uh, 6.2 release. So now let's say we want to, to kind of use uh, Susan's example. I noticed I got some uh, of these objects are bound to at least two or more modules. Here's one that's got 12. So what if I wanted to drill down and see those uh, to see what modules make up that object? So let's go tweak our application real quick and make that drill down possible. So remember, I already created a, um, a, a data source for modules and a, and a grid that lists them. So all I need to do is bring that into my app and throw a little action in there so that users can bring that grid up relative to whatever row they've uh, selected in this program object list. So what I'm going to do is add the widget. I'm going to go find, oh, here it is right at the top. And I'm going to say add it as a pop-up. So this widget is going to show up right down here in my, in my designer, and it's a pop-up. And I can click it and see what it looks like. I can see it's kind of kind of slim. I want to make it make it about a thousand width so I can get more, more in there. It'll be centered automatically when it comes up. And that looks good enough. I, I mean, maybe I'm going to go 1100 because I see a little bit of truncation going on there. OK, and then. Uh, the last thing I need to do now is I got this grid brought into my app. Now I need to create some sort of interaction. How can I get from this grid, my main grid, to my uh, module list, and but only, only list the modules that are pertaining to the program object that I selected on? And this is where I go into behaviors, and I say, OK, whenever I click on a row, Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add I'm going to add what's called an icon column. So this will be like a button that the users can click on, and the the tooltip will be list modules for this program. I can type right. Let's go find it. Let's go find an icon that looks like a list. Like this looks good. So I'm going to save that. Actually, I'm going to do one more thing. Uh, Let's see. When I click on this icon, I want to filter another widget. I'm going to filter the only other widget I have on my app, which is the modules list. And my filter is going to be, I'm going to be filtering on the program name and the program library. So it's going to automatically find the correlation for me. And then just show me the, the modules in that. So in fact, while I'm in there, I might say modules in program name. So I'm going to save that and save all this. Now let's go launch that app again and see what it looks like. So if I launch it now, I see a little 
button has been added to the to the to the far right. And if I go back down to that list where I had here's one with two, if I click that, now I'm seeing just the two uh, modules that are in that program object. And this one here, VB serve program, this is what we call our RPG toolkit. This is for anyone that has valence that writes RPG code. If they want to interact with the browser from their RPG program, they can bind this service program to their RPG program and communicate directly with the browser or the mobile app uh, using the valence tools. So if I click this, I can see there's all these different modules in there. VVN for pulling uh, elements in from the browser, VV out for sending elements out to the browser. VBPDF for generating PDFs, VB utility for various utility functions, VB IFS for interacting, interacting with the IFS and so forth. So lots of stuff out there. And of course, if I want to take all this data and go you know, do something with it in Excel, I can just say, download this to Excel, give me all pages, and then I can go pull this up and, and you know, maybe take this into a meeting to say, look, here's all the program objects that we have in our system. You know, we got too many, what are we gonna do about it? <laughs> so I'll get rid of that. Okay. So that, uh, and one, one thing I'll do real quick, just uh, as a aside, I'm gonna go back into this app. I'm gonna say, I don't want this uh, icon button to show except when there's more than one module. Um, so what we can do is we can condition we can, can condition this icon column by saying, I only want this show that, or make this enabled when the number of modules is greater than one. So I'm gonna save that, save that. And I'm gonna go back to it now. And now you'll notice that these are all disabled except for the ones that have um, more than uh, one module making up that program object. So I click here and there's no action. So, and keep in mind, one of the things, so I, I'm, I'm pretty much done developing my app, but I just wanna point out that in this world of, of web development, especially in low code app development, you get a lot of neat functionality. So for example, let's say I wanted to sort by the number of modules. I just click on that row and it just does it by, by intrinsically. It's, it's one of the nice features. And if I wanted to make that my primary column, I could go stick that over here. Maybe I want to make this a little smaller. Maybe I want to hide some things. I want to turn off this and that and this. So these are the sort, sorts of features that give your users, you know, if they're going kicking and screaming from the green screen world, you give them things like this and they're like, oh, oh okay, that can, this is handy. So it kind of helps you sell some of your modernization objectives when you have a tool like this that makes it so easy to deploy. So, okay. So let me go back to my presentation, just to explain a little bit now what I just demonstrated to you. So uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about what's included with Valence. So the Valence portal is what I just logged in to. So that was where you type your user and password. And you can control all the authority settings, who, what users can launch which apps and, and so forth. Um, you get the RPG toolkit, which I'm not really getting into because the, the topic for this presentation is low code or no code. No code unless you consider SQL to be coding, but it's very low code otherwise. Um, Nitro App Builder, which I just ran through. Uh, Nitro iAdmin, which is a tool that lets you do administrative functions uh, through your, your mobile phone or through your, your, uh, your browser with the Valence portal. A file editing util utility, so you can call up your physical files and logical files and make changes to it in your browser. Um, I, an IFS Explorer and Fusion 5250, which is an emulator uh, right from within your browser. So the, the highlight of this little segment is the Nitro App Builder. I'll quickly just walk through a few of these other things at the end of the session, but just wanted to kind of keep the focus on this low code tool because this is really the, the special sauce to Valence. This is what makes it such a popular utility in the IBM I world. So that Nitro App that I created, the Nitro App Builder app, the anatomy of it kind of breaks down very simply into three elements. First of all, we have the data source. So that was my SQL that I pasted into, into the uh, data source uh, screen of the Nitro App Builder utility. Then I linked to that a grid widget. So we visualize our data source using widgets. So I used a grid widget or the subfile on steroids. You could also, if you had like XY type data coming out of your data source, you could link a chart widget to it and show a chart. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, once you have those, uh, you can create an app, which I did. I put that grid widget into an app, and then I brought a second grid widget into the app and linked them through behaviors. 
You can also have separate data sources with their own widgets and bring those into your app. And those collectively can be uh, used to, to present data to the user however they want to see it uh, based on their actions. And you can share widgets between your various apps. So just drilling down in a little bit more detail what I just did, uh, using behaviors was, was where you get the action, the interaction for the users. So they can say, if a, for example, if you had a bar chart widget and the user clicked on one of the bars, then maybe that would bring up a grid showing the detail behind that bar. Or if a row, or in our case, an icon uh, was clicked on a grid, then that might bring up another widget, or in this case, a map utility, maybe to show the location of a customer or their ship to location. Um, and more importantly for us as RPG developers is you can, you can add functionality to these apps so it calls an RPG program and you have your RPG do whatever business logic you need and it can send back a response saying I was successful, or it might send back instructions saying, okay, hide this widget and show that widget. It's very interactive for RPG developers to quickly whip out uh, web or mobile apps uh, using very simple RPG code. So uh, one example might be you have a list of customers and you want to put a customer on credit holds. You get have a little credit hold button next to the customer. You click it, it calls an RPG program that executes whatever business logic is necessary to uh, set that customer status, and then it might reflect that in the grid when you refresh. So um, with Nitro App Builder, what are we solving? What is the point of all this? The low code, this whole low code notion, what are we solving with it? Well, basically it can take way too long to deploy useful and modern web apps and mobile apps to your IBMI users. There's a lot of coding required, generally speaking, if you're doing it from scratch. And businesses these days don't have the time to wait while you are tinkering with HTML code and whatnot to try to whip out the apps that they need. So, and the learning curve can be really steep. So, and it's also really hard to get the resources necessary to deploy these apps. So that's what the purpose of Nitro App Builder is. If you've got an understanding of your database and basic programming abilities, uh, you can whip out some applications for your users in literally within a matter of minutes uh, from the time you've installed uh, Valence onto your system. Okay, so in the time I have left, I'm going to flip back into demo mode again and just kind of show you some of the other stuff that's in uh, in uh, Valence. So I'm in I'm in my Valence 6.2 program objects app. I'm just going to dismiss that. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the Nitro app builder. So I'm back to my uh, my launch pad, and I'll just start walking through some of these. So Nitro file editor, um, this is just basically a, a, a tool that lets you, it's great for developers. I wouldn't advocate giving this to your users, but any any uh, file on your system, I'm saying library list. So you define obviously your environment. So it already knows what library list it's going after and it'll bring up a file. So this is a, you know, a demonstration customer master that we include at Valence. So I can go and go and look for something and just click on, double click on a row and make changes to it. And that will just update it right away. So that's actually. And so Rob, can I uh, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. I'm not sure how much time you have left, but I wanted to uh, let you know I got several questions from people asking if Valence can update data back to the database. So I'm not sure if you were planning on showing that, but if not, uh, if you could save some time just to maybe demo like a quick edit grid or or form, sure. I think that would be helpful for people. I. Um, I don't think they believe that it's really that easy, but you'll show them how easy it is. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sure. I will do a quick, uh, I'll just create a quick uh, maintenance utility over this uh, um, customer master. So that's uh, that's the file editor utility. Um, I'll dismiss that. The IFS Explorer is just a quick browser-based tool to go you know, look for something inside your, uh, in your, in your IFS, so. Uh, it's you could do you could in theory do some HTML coding in there too. It's really mainly just for perusing things and quickly moving things around in the IFS. Uh, Nitro App Builder we were just in and we'll come back to. I mentioned Nitro iAdmin earlier. This is a utility that uh, basically lets you kind of monitor what's going on uh, in your system. If someone calls you up, or you're out at lunch, and they say yeah, the system's you know bogged down, you could pull this up on your mobile app and. Uh, and see the, you know, you can see what are the top jobs eating up. Obviously our system's pretty idle right now, but if it were a busy system, I might see a job here that's cranking at 99% CPU. I could click on it and see the call stack and the job log and the open files and maybe decide, oh, you know, I'm gonna kill this job. So I could go back here and say, end it. Um, 
a user might say, oh, I forgot my password and you're out enjoying your, your power lunch. And you're like, oh God, I gotta reset this guy's password. So you can just do it right from your phone, go here to the user and go change his password and set it to something else. So uh, that would be, this is the desktop version. And obviously there's a, a mobile component to that as well. Uh, spool file viewer is kind of handy, just a, a tool to quickly, uh, you know, pull up spool files, see that, you know, see them on the screen and you can download them as a PDF. Uh, so you can go, go take it off and print it or whatever you need to do. Um, this can be incorporated into your Nitro app builder apps too. So if you're, if you're calling an RPG program that creates a spool file, you can quickly render it right in the browser, make it really easy for the users. Another stepping stone for your modernization objectives. If you're doing a lot of RPG development and you're creating things that create JSON responses, this is a great tool for just saying, okay, does it working? So we have a bunch of example programs. We have one called X, SQL, EX Grid All, and there's an action on it called Load Grid, I think it is. So if I call that, I can see it's sending back a whole bunch of JSON and gobbledygook. Here's our formatted JSON. So it's just a great way, great way to test if you're creating APIs on your system or, or web services, you can just make sure that it's responding the way you want it to. And you, you can take this uh, and go paste it into uh, a tool for validating the data and so forth. Um, okay, well, I don't wanna get too deep in the weeds. There's lots of other, lots of things with administration and active sessions and whatnot. But what I do wanna mention is back to the Nitro App Builder to our low code, no code app utility. These are all examples that are included with the, each valence. So when you install it, you'll see basically the same launch pad minus this valence 62 program objects I just created. And you can go in here and actually see applications that are developed with the Nitro App Builder tool. So here's an example of a customer dashboard. It's got a list of countries and uh, you know, who's, who's the biggest, who has the most customers. So if I go click here on Germany, I can drill in and use it's using a map widget. So this is just imagine in the background, this is just an SQL statement saying select customers and address from, you know, customer master where country equals Germany. And it's going to send it back and you can say, okay, take that address and map it into a map widget and just show me the pegs. Uh, so and these are these are KPI key performance uh, indicators, which are just very simple SQL statements, select count from uh, customer master, select total sales, you know, and so forth. So real easy to whip these things up and impress your boss. Um, uh, using some of those same IBMI SQL utilities, this is just an example of something else doing that. This is bringing back a list of job queues. This is bringing back users on the system who's been disabled, who's got security officer authority. Here's a uh, one showing that our disk space is getting up there. I guess we got to start doing some maintenance housekeeping. The current CPU load, total active jobs, total jobs. So it's, all these are things that you can, if you know the IBM ISQL utility, you can quickly map it to a widget and throw it out and create an app that you can deploy. Um, it could be launched from this launch pad or someone could get, you could just email a link to someone and send them right into that, depending on what kind of authority you want to set up with them. Okay, so let me show you an, uh, an application that's maintaining uh, customers. So this this is basically an SQL statement that says, you know, bring in the customers and I want to be able to make changes to it. So if I, I go here, oh, we got, <laughs> got a link to show the location where American Airlines is located. That's where DFW is, I believe. But if I just click on the row, we have it bringing up a, a form, a form widget, which is one of the widgets you can create. And we've got basically fields that, are, that the users are allowed to change and fields like the customer number which they're not allowed to change. And you can control all this and you can have validation RPG programs that are called. So you can, for instance, validate that the zip code is a proper format or validate that they didn't leave the address blank or you know, any, any kind of rules that you have in RPG, you can invoke and use to, to validate this. So if I tried to leave that blank, well, this is a front end check, but you might have a back end check that says uh, you can't have American Airlines listed twice or something like that. So. And you can create combo boxes. So this is basically, this is a data source that's just saying select, you know, states from uh, your, your state master. And it just creates a list that, that makes it easier for the user. So instead of having to type TX or AK, I can just select it right from the list and, and run with it there. And then they can save it. So I just changed American Airlines address to Arizona. Let's see, where did it go here? thought it didn't. 
or maybe Oklahoma. Hmm, interesting. We don't have that wired up right. <laughs> Let's see what's going on with that. But um, anyway, you can have the back end validate all that and make sure it's uh, staying in sync with what, what your business rules are. So that's an example of a, of a maintenance app. Um, here's an example of a, an actual dashboard app. So if I go, in this case, I've got uh, links behind uh, bars on the chart. So I can say, bring up a list of, and this is also just an SQL statement, show me uh, inventory levels by period for current year and previous year, and just plot them on a on an overlay graph. So as long as you know where that data resides, it's real easy to get to. Um, and you can actually jump into other apps and actually call up that order uh, and uh, change things like that. So uh, let's see, is there anything else here that would be worth doing real quick? I'm, I know I'm getting kind of tight on time. Um, Here's another example of a maintenance app that's driven off of a map. So in this case, I can go click on a peg and it'll bring up the form to edit that customer and I can make changes to it right there. So um, I think I'm a little tight on time, but just to, just to really quickly show uh, how I would do a, a maintenance app real quick, uh, I would probably create, first of all, let's just say, let's select everything from demo CMAST. And that's going to basically give me a, a, a list of records for the customer. We'll call it demo CMAST lunch. Oh, okay, demo CMAST two. <laughs> and then I want to create a widget over that. And there's many, many different ways to create an application that edits data, but the easiest way is just to create what's called an edit grid. So I'm going to say, give me an edit grid over that. And I'm just going to really quick and dirty just show all the all the customer uh, all the columns in the customer file. I'm going to say uh, when it comes to editing, when they're adding a record, they have to they have to do everything except for the last activity date. When they're editing, then the customer numbers read only, but they'll see all these other ones. Um, and then you can you can invoke a uh, a validation program here, I could say, you know, valid CM. And so if I, this is an RPG program. So I could say whenever a, a user tries to save a record, it's going to call your valid CM RPG program, which checks all the data that's coming in. And if it doesn't like anything, it'll spit back an error message saying, nope, invalid customer name or invalid zip code. And you can basically validate what they, what they've entered. So Let's see, real quick, demo CMAS to edit two. So let's just see, I, I don't even know if I did this right. I'm just going to whip this out together, create an app real quick with that. Uh, edit grid in it. Quick, let's call it quick and dirty customer edit. Save it. I'll we'll put it up in the admin. Let's just go see what I what what monster I just created. So I'm going to click that and double click on that. I'm going to say CMX Corporation one two three. I'm going to save it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my program doesn't exist, so it's giving me an error. But anyway, you get the idea. It's actually trying to change it right now. So um, this is just one of many different ways that I could go about trying to create a uh, an application that would edit data. So. Any other questions, Richard? Uh, none that I think you need to address live. I'm, I'm just answering a few here in, in text. Okay. So I would encourage you then to uh, kick the tires on your own. Uh, you can go to uh, cnxcorp.com slash valence and download it. It's a free, you know, it, well, it's a 30 day trial by default, but we get grant extensions all the time. Um, you can quickly whip out some applications, and if you have any questions, you can uh, email me, and we'll get myself or one of our developers on the on the line with you, and we can walk you through uh, doing a proof of concept app that would uh, achieve whatever you're trying to do with your users. So, one other thing I, I didn't mention is the uh, for those that are still uh, dealing with green screen apps, we do have an integrated green screen uh, component in here, so it works just like a regular green screen except it's running in the browser. So you could actually, that's as a stepping stone, you could have an, a mix of green screen and web uh, homogenized into one uh, you know, interface 
so that maybe you have an existing green screen app that is called by clicking on a certain action in a or certain row or button in your in your valence app or vice versa you could have a green screen launched into a valence app if the user hits a function key for example so lots of different uh tricks you can you can do with uh with the valence uh, toolkit here so all right well thank you for your time i hope uh i hope that wasn't too much like drinking from a fire hose i just wanted to <laughs> give you a quick uh Quick introduction to what uh, what's available for you with the low code, no code uh, app development utility and valence. So I think I will hand it back to Susan. Great, that uh, that is always. Even though I've actually used the tool myself, I'm always amazed at the kind of stuff that Rob's able to do. All the all singing, all dancing version uh, of uh, of the kinds of things that I can do. Uh, oh, I forgot to show my video back on. There we go. Uh, thanks, Rob and Richard, for all those great answers. He's He's been hard at work in the background there, Rob. So, uh, all right, very good. Should give him a, a extra pat on the back today. Um, <laughs> so, all right. don't go away yet, everybody. Uh, I've still got the dessert. If anybody's got room left for dessert, um, I've still got a little more to talk about with Ivy My Services. Uh, we were scheduled to go until... Uh, 2.15 Eastern time here. So hopefully I'll be able to get that done uh, without uh, taking up too much extra time. Let me go ahead and share my screen and start, start my presentation then. So um, as I said, this is the dessert portion. So in the first part, um, in the appetizer, of our meal, we talked about, um, I just used one very simple service, probably the simplest kind of all, which is just a view. Like an SQL view is just like writing an SQL statement on any kind of table or file that you've ever done before. Um, it's uh, that That's really all there is to that. There are some others that are implemented in slightly different ways. Sometimes they're not views, sometimes they are SQL procedures, sometimes they're functions or what are called table functions, a special kind of function. So I'll, I'll introduce you here to a few more types of, uh, of services that we have that are implemented in slightly different ways. And uh, in most of my examples, by the way, well, many of them, I guess I can't really say for sure how many are, are which, uh, but in this example, for example, uh, you have the, I'm actually showing RPG code. So uh, it is a cut down version of the RPG code. So of course, don't forget that whenever you're using SQL and RPG, you should be doing all your exception error handling with things like checking for SQL state or SQL code and all of that. Our code actually does that. I just cut that part out to make it fit on the chart. I uh, just want to make sure everybody's clear about that. So you're using SQL, all the same business rules for how you how you do that and how do you figure out what what's happened and when things go wrong. Uh, you uh, you'll need to to still do all of that stuff. So here's an example of using uh, data queues. Now there are similar services for data areas, but in my opinion, the um, built-in support in RPG for data areas is pretty easy to use. And I think covers most of the situations that I've ever needed anyway for data areas. So I decided to choose data queues to show here as an example instead. Um, now this really forms pretty much the same, performs the same kind of function that queue send data queue and queue receive data queue do. If you've never used data queues, uh, those that all may sound like gobbledygook to you, but if you have, I suspect you're familiar with those, uh, those APIs. Um, so the, the first one that I'm showing here is the send data queue. We're gonna put a message out on the queue that will be retrieved by another program or another job somewhere. Um, so uh, what I have here is I have the, the message that's part of that job is in a data structure. Uh, notice that we can't actually send the data structure name itself. So one little bit of RPG detail here that I've got to specify, um, it, or if you figure out how to do it, let me know. But I, we couldn't make it work. Um, the uh, What we did was we just created another subfield here called pet data and said it covers all of the, the data structure. So the full length of the data structure starting in position one. So basically what we're saying is that pet data overlays the pet data structure. Hopefully that's clear. 
Um, so you'll see that in, I think, in a couple of uh, these examples as we go through this. So what I have here is, of course, at some point you would need to put some logic in there to, um, to populate that data structure with the information that you want to go on the data queue. And then you can do, call, uh, do an exec SQL call. So it's not a regular call, it's an SQL procedure. So you're gonna do exec SQL call, and then uh, the name of the procedure that you're calling, which is Q send data queue, um, Q QSYS2 send data queue. And there's a couple of different ways you could specify the parameters that, that get sent to it. My favorite way is, is the more verbose way. And so a lot of RPGers are not keen on having to key a lot of stuff in. Um, so maybe it won't be your favorite way, but I like to do it this way because it's more obvious. Not only when another person comes along to look at my code, do exactly what's going on, um, but when I come back a, a week or a year from now to look at this code, it makes it easier for me to understand what I'm doing and what's being passed where. Because a lot of times it's hard to tell. So this the other example, the second example down here, just calls like we would sort of normally do a, a call from RPG where you just list out the parameters. So, uh, and you notice my parameters, by the way, some of which are um, SQL variables, right? So the RPG variables in the SQL, I should say. RPG, they call, what do they call them? Host variables, I think is what SQL calls them, with a little colon in front. And of course, usually in an RPG program, everything would, would tend to be um, those variables as opposed to my hard-coded values here, uh, or you know, some, uh, you know, named constants or something like that. Um, but uh, basically, you, you have your choice. Of course, what you need to do is if you're not going to include the names of the parameters that you're passing, and those are, of course, documented within the, um, the services documentation. Uh, if you're not going to include them, then you need to make sure, just like you do with regular RPG call, that you're putting the right data in the right position, right? The first parameter, the second parameter, the third one. And notice that I call them in a completely different order up above. And I can do that because I'm listing the actual parameter name. A little bit like CL does, right? CL commands, you've got some parameters that you don't need to specify the keyword and other ones that you do, depending on what sequence you're doing them and things like that. So it's a similar concept to that. Um, so the um, to receive entries from a data queue, so the idea is you put the message on the queue, some other program comes along uh, like this one and is going to receive the items off that queue. Typically, um, it's, it's possible to have keyed data queues, but in this case, it's not keyed. It's just going to ret retrieve uh, first in, first out, right? So it's going to retrieve them in order from the queue. So again, this one, though, is not uh, a procedure. This is a table function. So um, the SQL table functions, the syntax is a little different. Uh, it's actually done like a function. It's done from um, a select statement. So I'm saying here, I want to select message data into um, pet data. I'm retrieving this data from the queue and it's going to go in and populate my um, data structure here. Uh, from table, and then I specify the uh, qsys 2receive data queue and my two parameters for the uh, data queue and library. Since I'm not using a key here, I only need those two. Now, this will do just like regular, um, the regular queue receive data queue does. It removes the entry from the queue. That's kind of the way data queues work, right? You put stuff on it, somebody else pulls stuff off, and then it, it cleans itself up as we go along, as we pull stuff off. If you don't want that, maybe you have, for some reason, a need to actually go and look at the queue entries without actually removing them from the queue. And so there's another one that works. It's a procedure called data queue entries in QSYS2. I'm not gonna show you an example of that in the interest of time, but you can go look it up. Uh, as, I, as I say on one of the later charts, um, the documentation is surprisingly good. Um, I say surprisingly because I'm used to looking at a system API documentation on our system, which is not exactly RPG friendly sometimes. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the uh, services for IFS files. Now, there's multiple multiple ways that you can do this. You can even, uh, I believe, write to IFS files using SQL in a, in a different way without using this service. But like I said, many different tools in the toolbox. 
Uh, it's always good to, to have many different options you could choose from and decide which is the best option for your particular situation. So I can read from an IFS file using the IFS read table function. I can write to it using the ISF write procedure call. So this is very similar to the data queue thing, right? The data queue thing, when you're writing something out, it's a procedure call. When I'm reading something in, it's a table function. Um, it's just slightly different syntax and, and the way those things work. So here I've got an RPG example where I'm actually showing that I, where the where the thing comes in, where the service actually comes into play is on the declare cursor. So I'm just gonna declare a cursor called IFS cursor. Here's the select statement uh, from the table, IFS read, I give it the path name. Um, it's a CSV file in this particular case. And so then from that point on, it's just normal SQL. If you have normal uh, cursor operations when, within your RPG code to do other things, this is exactly the same, nothing else is different including, of course, as I said before, all that um, checking of the SQL state and SQL code and or SQL code uh, to, uh, to find out what's going on within your program. So I'm going to open the cursor. I'm going to have some sort of loop going on here to fetch from that cursor until I don't have any more data, which I find out using SQL state. Um, and then I close the cursor. So um, very simple, you know, Simple example. There are often a lot of other options here for all of these, by the way. So obviously their documentation will give you more options. My mission here is to just expose you to these, to know what's out there, give you a rough idea of how one might use them uh, in a very simple case. But more complex cases can also be handled in many, in many situations because there are more options than what I'm showing you here. In order to write to the IFS, um, Again, this is very similar to the data queue one, except instead of uh, writing to a data queue, sending to a data queue, it's an IFS write procedure call. So I have my data that I wanna send out there. And so I just do my exec SQL call, IFS write. Uh, I tell it where I want it to write it to, um, the actual file, and then the data that is to go out there, which is done as a variable. I'm showing you the variable definition up above. Obviously, we'd usually perhaps be a little more complex than just a character, 30 character field, but there you go. Um, there are other variants and several options here. So like UTF-8, for example, um, is available. And there's uh, several other options that I'm not showing, particularly with the IFS stuff. So if you if you like the idea of this, but you're not convinced there, it can handle everything you need, I would encourage you to go look at the documentation. I'll be showing you um, that link again a little bit later in some places where you can get more examples and things. I don't actually have um, a, uh, by the way, I just noticed a question popped in here about writing to IFS files. If you write um, another line, would it append or replace? And that's an option. You can specify by default, it appends. So that's why, um, you know, mine, I just use the very simplest one. I took all the defaults. Um, by default, it, uh, it will append. That's what that particular one did. But if you want it to do something different, there are different options. So the problem determination, this is something that I, I have to uh, give credit really to, um, well, I saw Sue Romano uh, do this, uh, do a session on this topic. And I kind of um, took some of her ideas for a lot of these things, but particularly this one, I thought was particularly useful for developers. Because if you have, um, you know, if you have problems, you know, especially if there's some sort of failure in your application, isn't it always useful? Did you always wish, oh, wish I knew what the job looked like right then, or I knew, I wish I knew what the caller of this program was at the time, uh, or what the library list looked like, or what the object locks were. If you're having a, a record lock issue, uh, maybe you can recover from that somehow. Uh, you know, so any of these kinds of things, I just wanted to expose you to the fact that these, as well as some other things that might be very useful for problem determination, you know, if you have some uh, special procedures in RPG that, that are run when something goes wrong, you might want to add, think about adding some of these kinds of things. You could just gather up the job log, you know, when the, when the, it's sort of a last will and testament, perhaps of perhaps of the program as it is dying. Perhaps you could be able to go in there and grab some of this information um, and keep it for 
part of the post-mortem, so to speak, of uh, figuring out what went wrong within that application. So I think that's always very helpful. The other thing that we can do here is um, to manage, there's a lot of services with spool files. I'm just gonna touch on a couple of them, but there are a lot more. Um, so purging unneeded spool files. So, you know, the, all that extra disk space that Rob's system has on it, maybe he could purge some of his unneeded spool files quickly here. Uh, maybe Valence has a way to do that too, I don't know. But um, basically you can do it based on the age so that, you know, they've got the uh, delete older than uh, functionality here for, as a parameter. Um, you also can do a preview. So uh, if you're like me and are always afraid, to, I don't want to delete anything without double checking and making sure I'm deleting exactly the right stuff. So you can just run the preview yes, and that will not actually delete anything, even though it says delete, uh, delete all school files. The preview yes says, just show me the list of things that you would delete if I weren't in preview mode, right? Um, so I've done that and notice that it's not just the age of it. It could also be the username or the output queue where the thing comes from that you can filter on. The last statement here is actually going to do the deletion. So once I was happy with the fact that I wanted to take the 90 days uh, old ones, uh, then I could go in and, and uh, remove those by saying preview no, which by the way, preview no is the default. That's important to know. You may be thinking that, uh, you know, maybe I'll get a chance to take a look at a list before it actually happens. If you say preview, no, it, which is the only way to actually do the delete, that's it. They're gone. Uh, there's many more spool file services. Look at output queues, drill down into those output queues to see the entries in a queue, drill down, drill down into one of those entries to look at the spool file data. There's even uh, SysTools generate.pdf. And I've got an example of that here. Looks really simple, maybe not quite as simple as that little button that Rob did to um, generate the PDF of his uh, grid there, but you know, from an RPG program, uh, this is, uh, you know, if you generated a report and just occasionally you need to have a PDF version of it or something, you could do this. Obviously, again, keep in mind, I've got all this stuff hard coded because I just put this into ACS, run SQL scripts. Um, all of these things can be passed as parameters embedded inside an RPG program. So it doesn't have to be hard coded, obviously, or it wouldn't be nearly as useful. Um, speaking of run SQL scripts, and I hope that's how all of you are working with your SQL when you're doing your development and you're testing out your, your SQL statements and things. Um, run SQL scripts in ACS. Well, it's my favorite way. I'm not saying it's necessarily the best. I know there are other tools built into different places. And so, um, but it's it's certainly a good way to do that. And particularly in the case of looking for examples of these services, particularly, um, you can go into run SQL scripts, look under edit, and there's an examples option and there's an exert, exert insert um, from examples. Select that and what you'll see is something come up that looks like this. Now I have already selected from this little selection icon, whatever that thing's called there, a little pull down that will um, list all kinds of things. It's not just IBMI services. This is all kinds of SQL examples. So I selected the IBMI services ones. And if I wanted to, for example, I know it's something related to spool files. I could search for spool up here in the search bar. Uh, this particular one is generate PDF, the one I just showed you. And so it's not just one example. Usually there's two or three examples of uh, various ways you can use it. And you can highlight one of those and then hit the insert button. And that will um, put it right in back into your run SQL scripts dialog. And now you can you know, modify it to use your particular um, data that you need to specify there for the parameters and things like that. So very useful. I did this. I, I use this a lot um, for uh, getting ready for this this session. There is um, a lot more. I have barely touched the surface of what's out there. A lot of people also have written about these things, and I relied heavily on many of their uh, articles and examples um, in learning it myself and in creating these presentation, this presentation. So uh, shout out to especially Simon Hutchinson and Ted Holt. 
um, two guys who do a lot of coding, uh, writing about RPG coding and a lot of really good, useful examples. So I've got the links to Simon's post. Now, it, not, not everything he writes about clearly is about IB My Services, but he has covered a lot of them. Uh, over the periods of time that he's been writing his blog post. And Ted Holt, I always love Ted's examples. He, I learn something new and think of new ways of using things uh, from, from Ted's um, articles. So I highly recommend also taking a look at the kinds of things that Ted has written about related to these. The best thing to do is usually to uh, just Google um, your the particular name of the service and one of their names, Ted Holt or and or Simon Hutchinson. And one example here, this one with the IT Junk one is using SQL to replace reports. What that is, is him reading a, an SQL, a, sorry, reading a spool flat and then producing it in some other format. I think it might be CSV, I'm not sure. Can't remember right now, but anyway. Uh, and then of course is the IB My documentation. As I said before, um, it was surprising to me how, how, how easy it was for me to understand as an RPG or unlike a lot of the system API documentation, which is not so easy um, sometimes to do that. So again, this is a link. This isn't exactly the same link. Anton was very good to nice to put the actual link, direct link into the Q&A. So um, if for some reason this link isn't working for you or is slow, uh, there's, there's another version of the link here. I think the reason IBM uses this one is because that they have a little more control over if the website changes underneath them, then they can still use the same link and, and translate it to something else. And don't forget about insert from examples. Uh, when you're looking for documentation and examples of how to do these things, I just showed you how to do insert from examples in, in ACS. As I said, I barely scratched the surface here. Um, many, many more useful um, services for developers, for RPG years, explore. I am confident that you will find something that simplifies your life. Uh, it, I've done that. It simplified, did away with a whole bunch of code I wrote. It's a little bit sad to say goodbye to all that code, but I was, I'm happy not to have to maintain it and modify it to add some new feature next time. Um, so there's that. Now it's your turn. So the challenge for you is to think of ways, open your mind up to the ways where these things might be useful to you to make your life as a developer easier. If you have any specific questions for me, I have my email address here on the chart and I would welcome any of you um, who would like to uh, ask me a question specifically. I will take a look at the Q&A if John hasn't already responded to all of them and see if there's anything else I can do there. But uh, for, for those of you that are uh, going to be leaving us now, just want to remind you that we do have a lot more. We have eight more uh, Lunch and Learn webinars coming up in the next, uh, this later this week and the next two weeks. You know, there's a link here to go and register. If you're not registered for all of them, you can go back and pick the ones that you want to see there. And we'll see you at a later Lunch and Learn.